This is video four on antiarrhythmics, and the topic is the class three drugs, potassium channel blockers. Potassium channel blockers act by prolonging the duration of the action potential. This necessarily prolongs the effective refractory period, which is really helpful at preventing those arrhythmias caused by reentry, particularly reentrant rhythms that are not dependent on the AV node, where beta blockers and calcium channel blockers would also be effective. In other words, potassium channel blockers are great drugs at preventing AFib, A flutter, and ventricular tachycardia. There are four major potassium channel blockers used in the US. They are amiodarone, dronetarone, sodalol, and dafetilide. There's a fifth potassium channel blocker called ibutilide that I decided to not include in the video as it's rarely used, but which you might come across in a textbook or review book. Ibutilide is available only IV and is used almost solely for the pharmacologic cardioversion of AFib or A flutter. Unlike the last two classes, since there are only four drugs here, I'm going to put the actions, indications, side effects, and any additional notes all on one chart and go through one drug at a time. So, starting with amiodarone, more commonly referred to as just amio, it's a really complex drug, arguably the most complex antiarrhythmic, and possibly one of the most complicated of all commonly prescribed drugs in any field. Starting with its actions, although it is classified as a class three antiarrhythmic, it actually has properties of all four classes. Amio has several indications, it's used to suppress VT, though not typically as a first-line agent due to its extensive toxicity. It is used to maintain sinus rhythm in patients with paroxysmal AFib or A-flutter. It can also rate control AFib and A-flutter when other more effective drugs for this purpose, such as beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, are contraindicated. And although it is not typically used with this intent, amio can also cardiovert AFib or A-flutter back into sinus rhythm. As already mentioned, amio has a very long list of side effects, almost all of which occur with chronic long-term treatment. The most dangerous is pulmonary fibrosis, which is why anyone started on amio with the intention of it becoming a long-term therapy needs a baseline chest x-ray and PFTs performed. Amio can also cause both hypo or hyperthyroidism on account of the very large amount of iodine it has. It can cause abnormal liver function tests, visual changes, and various neurologic symptoms. And when given IV, particularly when bolused, it can precipitate hypotension. Aside from its side effects, there are many additional things to know about amio's pharmacology. For example, it has a slow onset of action, a very large volume of distribution, and an extremely long half-life measured in weeks to months once steady state has been achieved. As a consequence, when starting amio, patients need to be loaded over a period of weeks during which the dose that's given is significantly higher than their anticipated eventual maintenance dose. Despite the frequency with which it's used out there in the world, because of its side effects, it should really be considered a second or third line medication when it's used as a long-term treatment rather than just a few weeks. Finally, although there are all these awful things about amio, one curious observation about the medication is that despite it causing QT prolongation, as all class three drugs do, it only very rarely causes an arrhythmia on account of that QT prolongation. The specific rhythm I'm talking about is called torsade de pointe, which is French for twisting of the points. In daily conversation in the hospital, this is shortened to just torsade, sometimes spelled with a silent S on the end, and sometimes not. Because torsade is such an important rhythm to know about when discussing potassium channel blockers, I'm going to take a break from the chart for two minutes to talk about it. Here's an example of what it looks like. The first half is not torsade, but demonstrates this patient's profoundly prolonged QT interval. There's a brief pause in the rhythm for some reason, and the second beat after the pause triggers a very rapid polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. If we were to follow this rhythm out for another 20 or 30 seconds, you would see a periodicity 
to the QRS morphologies. Torsad is seen solely in patients with a prolonged QT interval, either because of a genetic defect in one of the transmembrane ion channels, an electrolyte abnormality, or medications such as potassium channel blockers. The QT prolongation is not well demonstrated in this particular example because of the concurrent AV block, but it is there. As you might guess, this rhythm is very dangerous. While it can spontaneously revert back to sinus on its own, it can also easily degenerate into ventricular fibrillation and death. This is why monitoring the QT interval for patients on potassium channel blockers is so critical. But an interesting dilemma is that the QT prolongation is not really a side effect per se, but rather the confirmation that the drug is doing what we want it to do. Remember, these drugs interfere with reentry-based arrhythmias by prolonging the effective refractory period. So we expect some degree of QT prolongation, just not enough to cause this particular problem. I would not say that there is a magical hard cutoff of how much QT prolongation is too much, because as with everything in medicine, there is a benefit to harm trade-off. But most docs recommend changing treatment when the QT interval corrected for heart rate, known as the QT little c, exceeds 500 milliseconds. If torsade does occur, the first line treatment is IV magnesium, irrespective of whether the patient's serum magnesium level is already normal. So let's return to the chart to talk about dronetarone. Dronetarone is interesting because it is structurally similar to amiodarone, but without the iodine. Some people originally thought that maybe it could be used whenever amio was, but with fewer side effects. Unfortunately, that has not been borne out by studies. Its mechanisms of action are roughly similar to amio in that it shows class 1, 2, 3, and 4 activity, but currently its only conventional indication is in the maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with paroxysmal AFib and a flutter. It has not been around as long or used as much as amio, so the frequency of notable side effects are less well established, but it seems to cause QT prolongation along with pulmonary fibrosis, LFT elevation, heart failure, and diarrhea. Very importantly, it is contraindicated in patients with heart failure and or permanent AFib, as studies have shown worsened mortality when the drug was used in patients with those diagnoses. I'm not an electrophysiologist, so take this with a grain of salt, but I have never prescribed dronetarone and would need a lot of convincing to consider it. Its benefit over amio, even in supposedly indicated situations, has not been demonstrated in a clinical trial and frankly seems questionable, and two major studies have now shown harm in situations where benefit was originally expected. The next drug is Sotolol. As you might guess based on the suffix, Sotolol is not just a potassium channel blocker, but is also a beta blocker. Its primary indications are suppression of VT and maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with paroxysmal AFib and A-flutter. Its notable side effects include significant QT prolongation as well as all the typical side effects from beta blockade. Additional notes include the fact that Sotolol consists of a one-to-one -one racemic mixture of stereoisomers, both of which have potassium channel blocking properties, but only one of which has beta blocking properties. Sotolol should always be initiated as an inpatient for QT monitoring to ensure that a patient's QT interval does not increase too greatly with the medication. And although beta blockers in general are felt to be beneficial in the long-term treatment of heart failure, there is uncertainty specifically about Sotolol's safety in heart failure, so it's usually avoided in that situation. The last class 3 drug I'll discuss is dofetilide. Dofetilide's only significant action is on potassium channels. It is used primarily for the maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with paroxysmal AFib or A-flutter. While it can also be used for cardioversion of those rhythms, it's not particularly effective for that. Dofetilide also causes significant QT prolongation, and thus, as with Sotolol, it should also be initiated as an inpatient for QT monitoring. Before leaving the class 3 drugs, there is one additional related topic in antirhythmics to cover, which is most relevant in the context of this video.
the concept of use dependence versus reverse use dependence. These terms are not very good. More intuitive terms would be rate dependence and reverse rate dependence, but we are stuck with them for now. Use dependence is a property of some antiarrhythmics in which they demonstrate increased action at faster heart rates. This is seen with sodium channel blockers, particularly the 1C drugs, as well as with calcium channel blockers. A very tangible demonstration of this can occur when a patient on a class 1 antiarrhythmic develops a wider QRS complex when they become more tachycardic for any reason, even with just plain old sinus tachycardia. In contrast, drugs which exhibit reverse use dependence demonstrate increased action at slower heart rates. This is seen with potassium channel blockers excluding amiodarone, but including the potassium channel blocking effects of class 1A drugs. Thus, most class 3 drugs are more effective at slower heart rates, but are also more likely to cause torsade. So for example, if a patient presented to the ER with recurrent episodes of torsade in the setting of sodalol toxicity, if IV magnesium was insufficient to control them, additional treatments that could be tried include temporary pacing or isoproteranol with a goal heart rate of about 100 beats per minute. That's all for the potassium channel blockers. The next video in the series will cover class 4 drugs, the calcium channel blockers.